compete with no G League. I'm not competing with no NCAA. I'm doing my own thing. First season, we playing players. For decades, the NCAA has run a business that has exploited thousands of teens. While college coaches, institutions, media conglomerates, and corporate sponsors have all profited from the model. The JBA is a long-awaited solution to this ongoing problem. LeVar Ball's Junior Basketball Association was supposed to be the NCAA's killer. He was more than proud to announce his revolutionary league before brushing it under the rug after its collapse like an influencer rug pull. And that's not the only similarity to these scams. At best, this league was a failed business, and at worst, this was straight up fraudulent. Before we enter this shitstorm of a business, let's go back a few years to its roots. We all remember Chino Hill's historic run. Lonzo goes off to the NBA draft, LiAngelo goes on to break the NCAA steal record before the season even starts, and LaMelo gets pulled out of high school due to Chino Hills making a coaching change that didn't sit well with Papa LaVar. While Melo and LiAngelo, both in subpar scenarios, take their talents overseas, forfeiting the opportunity to ever play in the NCAA due to their professional status. Overseas, their performance was far from impressive. I mean, Lamelo averaged 6 points a game, he was a child at this time and incredibly immature on and off the floor, and realizing that they gave away the opportunity that got Lonzo front and center in the eyes of the NBA scouts, LaVar acted fast, creating what he thought was a hole in the market. A lot of people were actually pretty fond of the idea that LaVar presented. Top players from the ages of 16 to 21 could join the Junior Basketball Association, make 40 to 60% of their jersey sales priced at $80 a jersey, and earn $3,000 a month traveling the country playing basketball against other top kids, funded by the proceeds of the league as well as the big baller brand. The league was comprised of 80 players over 8 teams. LaVar messaged over 100 top high school stars over Twitter to start filling out roster spots, before whopping zero players accepted. So to open tryouts, we went. Some big names like Greg Floyd Jr., a four-star recruit from Vegas, and Marquise Brown, a three-star guard from Chicago, as well as, of course, LaMelo Ball and LiAngelo Ball, who joined halfway through the season after stating he didn't want to participate initially. And once the league launched, most praise and celebration of the league quickly stopped. This was basically one big ball advertisement. Uh, the league was a joke. I mean, every game was basically set to make LaMelo look as good as possible and maximize their family image. I mean, every team was literally called the Ballers, and LaMelo put up stat lines of 40-point triple doubles on sub-40% shooting basically every night. LiAngelo Ball joined the Los Angeles Ballers August 16th, cutting Brandon Phillips partway through the season, and this basically became Chino Hills basketball with the star player's dad writing your paychecks. Or, well, supposedly. After Brandon Phillips was cut by the team, he expressed that he was only paid one-third of his promised salary for a month's play, earning him just $1,000. I mean, they didn't even pay for his travel expenses, booted him from the league, and stripped his ability to ever play college basketball. Phillips was far from the only player not paid despite their efforts and risk joining the league. Even the promise of jersey royalties wasn't upheld, with JBA jerseys never officially going for sale. The league concluded with the Los Angeles Ballers shockingly winning the championship, with the Ball Brothers shockingly leading in every fucking stat, both averaging over 40 with LiAngelo averaging a 50 piece. But that may not have been true. Rumors surfaced surrounding the inflation of numbers through faulty stat keeping. Quite possible when you look at the other oddities, such as Atlanta Ballers player and close friend of the Ball family, Jordan Ray, having offers from Michigan, Michigan State, and UConn, according to the JBA, while 24-7 sports showing a completely different story. Many players state that LeVar had clear favoritism, aiming to prop up his guys to eventually get swooped up by the best league that they could. The league's conclusion left its players in the dark. Not only had most players not been compensated for their play, but the league was not in a financial position to continue operation past their inaugural season, leaving everyone wondering what happened to all the money. Answers are mainly speculative, but further research provides good indications that the JBA's failure was due to the greed of its founders. Starting with LeVar, the first red flag that pops up is the laughably high price point set for tickets to an arena. Starting at $40 for nosebleeds, JBA teams are lucky to fill up half of an arena, and if the game didn't feature the Ball Brothers, it's hard to imagine anyone showing up at all. LeVar makes clear statements that he believes in all of his products with their ludicrous price point. When it's your responsibility to pay these kids who sacrificed for the benefit of your family, there's a difference between being confident and fucking stupid. 
the ridiculous price point was clearly the latter. Players have made it clear what they think happened to some of the money, multiple players have come forward accusing co-founder Alan Foster of pocketing the cash, the same Alan Foster who defrauded the Ball family of millions of dollars, who was given a large control of the league's operations. Foster was at the very least aware of the issue, reporting that he'd get to the bottom of it in a Ball in the Family episode. There's no way to prove whether Foster stole from the kids or not, but every one of the league's owners should certainly be held responsible for exploiting these kids far more than the NCAA ever could have. It's hard to say if the JBA really benefited anybody. Lamelo well, faced more criticism at this time than any other in his career. It wasn't until he joined Spire Academy the following year that he started to actually prove that he was for real. This league was quite obviously an over-involved dad, creating a laughably poor league to elevate his kid's status at the expense of every other player in the league. And LeVar should be held accountable for the many, many careers that he destroyed from the lies that he told. If any good came from this shit show, you could possibly point to the G League jumping on the opportunity to offer up to $125,000 for recruits looking to skip the college scene and make some money on their own. This was the real pressure point that of course forced the NCAA to finally let their players make some money off their name. And if we give LeVar any credit for these changes, I'm not sure if it's valid, but all I can say was that he was the first. Thank you if you made it this far, and peace out.